the end of the day, what I mostly do in the industry is tell stories that in some way or other help people, to use this wonderful phrase from Edwin Schlossberg, create a context in which other people can think. So uh, it could be things like open source software or Web 2.0 or government as a platform. I try to make memes that help people understand what's going on. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some big ideas uh, from Silicon Valley that really will, I believe, shape the future of healthcare. I'll give you a couple of healthcare examples, but it's really I want to drill down into the context and the thinking about what can we learn when we really study uh, some of these successes. So, the first big idea, uh, and this was really the heart of what I called Web 2.0, was that all the companies that survived the dot-com bust, whether it was um, you know, Google or um, you know, now Twitter and Facebook or even Apple with the App Store, were all about harnessing collective intelligence. And this is, collective intelligence is summed up beautifully in this quote from Danny Hillis. Uh, Jeff Bezos gave this in a talk at uh, uh, O'Reilly's uh, uh, emerging Technology Conference, maybe around 2003. He says, global consciousness is that thing responsible for deciding that pots containing decaffeinated coffee should be orange. So think about that for a minute. What does that mean? Somehow, Sanka's brand color became this shared knowledge through communication from mind to mind. And of course, if you think about something like Twitter, that's this incredible acceleration of that process of shared meme making. So, for example, Occupy Wall Street trending right now on, on Twitter. You know, it's sort of like this new concept that came up, some people spread it. Uh, and of course, you see it also gets to Google. But think for a minute, what makes these things work? I love that e when you search for Occupy Wall Street on Google, there's even ads and commerce around it already. There's a market somehow that got, <laughs> got self-assembled here in a relatively short amount of time, right? But it all depends on something that I have called an architecture of participation. When Tim Berners-Lee designed the World Wide Web, he didn't design all this stuff that we have today. He designed a system that grew into all these things that we have today. He designed a system that was made up of small modular pieces that were independent, that could be owned by individuals, by anybody, but they were joined by open standard communication protocols. He had a simple standard open data format and he designed it to be extensible. And you know, it's kind of amazing how the web grew over the next 20 years. That's what happens when you design a system for participation. And it's also true of open source software projects like Linux and Apache. They were really all about uh, participation. So think about that in healthcare. Um, it turns out there's one really interesting example, uh, it's one that Anish and Farzad didn't mention, uh, something called uh, the Direct Project. Uh, incidentally, they had as a consultant Brian Bellendorf, who was one of the uh, founders of the Apache Project. But this is how they're trying to do health data interchange. They're not building an end-to-end -end system. They have a simple protocol. They have a, 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 a simple server. It looks a lot like the design of the World Wide Web. And more than that, they've tried to build a community around it. They've got working groups, all like the Internet Engineering Task Force. So they learn something from the Internet. They're trying to replicate it in healthcare. Uh, but since we're talking about social, you know, because of course community is another word for social, um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg asks, uh, how can applications be better when they're social? And it's easy when you think social to immediately go to Facebook, Google+, Twitter, and all the other kind of explicitly social apps. But I'm going to talk about social in a different context. I'm going to look at Wikipedia. You know, here's the first um, instance of the page about what we generally refer to as the Sendai earthquake in Japan. Uh, it was basically a simple one-liner. Uh, it became this a huge entry with all kinds of detail and pictures over the next uh, many months through thousands of edits. But more than that, there, it turns out there is a community. So here's a discussion of why the page is called the Tohoku earthquake rather than the Sendai earthquake, right? Because the community decided that that was a more appropriate term for how they talked about it in Japan, right? And so there's, there's this active community who builds that. And, and there's a wonderful uh, you know, thing you can do with Wikipedia precisely because it's, it's the result of this community, you can actually animate the history of 
of how Wikipedia entries evolve through the interaction of this community. And of course, there's a tool there as well, which is version control, which allows you to look at how something evolves over time. Uh, there's a wonderful new book uh, that I'm, I'm reading an examination copy of right now uh, called Reinventing Discovery by uh, Michael Nielsen. He says, Wikipedia is not an encyclopedia, it's a virtual city a city whose main export to the world is its encyclopedia articles, but with an internal life of its own. So when you think about social, think about communities, think about how you bring people together, and don't just think about uh, the applications. And there's another point that um, uh, Michael makes. He takes my phrase, the architecture of participation, and talks about the architecture of attention. And he does this by talking about a really interesting chess match, which Gary Kasparov called the greatest game in the history of chess. It wasn't his match with Deep Blue. It was his match that was organized by Microsoft in which he played against 50,000 people organized in the community. The game lasted four months. Uh, but what was interesting, there was an explicit community with discussion groups, moderators. Uh, there was an earlier sort of uh, Karpov against the world game, which Karpov just wiped everybody up because it was just done quickly and there was no sort of community. But the community worked. But what he points out in particular is this one move, uh, which was move 10, and there was a woman, Irina Krush, who had actually come up with a move that had never been played in chess before. She was an American uh, champion, you know, but not in Kasparov's league. But she had thought about this particular move, and the opportunity came up to make it. And she had thought about it, and so it totally blew the game open in new directions. It was extremely challenging. And as he says, Krush was inferior to Kasparov in nearly every area except this one. And that is the benefit of crowdsourcing, of community. You bring people together and you find the expertise you need. So again, wonderful book for thinking about what science can learn from internet uh, startups. But while I'm talking about social, I want to talk another big idea from Silicon Valley. This is also from Mark. He, this is from his recent EG8 uh, comments. He said, people tell me, it's great you played such a great role in the Arab Spring, but it's also kind of scary because you enable all this sharing and you collect information on people. And he, but he went on, he said, it's hard to have one without the other. You can't isolate some things you like about the internet and then uh, control other things that you don't like. And one of those things that we really have to rethink is privacy. Uh, medical privacy uh, is right now is sort of framed in things like HIPAA, kind of like the Maginot line. Somehow we can build a better line around this stuff. We can keep this stuff secret. And I think we need to move instead to a regime in which we assume that most things can be known. And it becomes much more like the regime for insider trading, where you start saying, well, here's what you can and can't do once you know those things. Um, next big idea I want to talk to you about is an idea of that I would call it human-computer symbiosis. It was first articulated by J.C.R. Licklider in 1960. Uh, he was actually the DARPA program manager who funded the early work on the internet. But this, is, I think, is a really fabulous insight. Um, and of course, we saw that. And this is a snapshot which I picked up off of Twitter from last night's uh, presentation uh, with an exoskeleton. It seems like man-machine symbiosis in an interesting way. But what about this, the Google Autonomous Vehicle? I thought the whole point of this thing was that it drove by itself. Right? So how is that human-computer symbiosis? This is where I'm going to try to give you some interesting context. In 2005, Stanley won the DARPA Grand Challenge, going seven miles in seven hours. So this year, when Google said, we've driven hundreds of thousands of miles in ordinary traffic, what was the difference? Peter Norvig said, we don't have better algorithms. It's not better AI. We have more data. And it turns out that when Google sent out those street view cars, you know, the ones that made the pictures that go on your maps, on your phone, or in your browser, they were also measuring everything. And so they know, the car knows exactly where it is. And here's the human-computer symbiosis part. Effectively, when you think about it, those autonomous vehicles are able to drive because they are remembering what was done previously by a human driver augmented with sensors and remembered by this massive database in the sky. And that's a template for a whole new class of application. Uh, Ken Goldberg, who's a computer science and robotics professor at Berkeley, says we're entering what he calls the post-robotic era, which is characterized by man-machine cooperation. Take robotic surgery. You know, you kind of think, well, gosh, this is just a surgeon. He's teleoperating this robot, and it's got more precision and so on. But it's more than that. Ken did a study 
And he, what they were actually doing was they were actually looking at what human surgeons did in the same way that Google Street View car looked at what human drivers did. And it says, oh, actually, that's what they're trying to do. We've looked at a bunch of instances, and we can do that more precisely. Right? So the, the robot is learning from humans. That's the real meaning of man-machine symbiosis. So think about that. I want to talk about what you might call the Wanamaker problem. Uh, John Wanamaker was in many ways the father of modern advertising. He was a, he was a, a, you know, a business magnate. And he said, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. Uh, well, you know, we know that pay-per-click advertising like Google AdWords really has changed that for advertising. You know, you think on the internet, we've solved the Wanamaker problem. We started paying for the stuff that works instead of just paying for impressions. Does that sound at all like what Anish and Farzad were talking about? Yeah, sure does. Yeah, that's in exactly uh, where I was going there. In the Accountable Care Act, they're trying to do for healthcare what Google did for advertising. Uh, but it's also true uh, that personalized medicine and diagnostics are changing in that way. I was recently at a GE event, and uh, Pascal Witz, who's the, the head of GE's medical diagnostics division, was talking to me, and this is not an exact quote, but she said something like, 1% of healthcare spend is now on diagnostics. We think of diagnostics as you do a bunch and then you do treatment, but it's now shifting to a, a regime in which you're doing diagnostics, treatment, tr diagnostics, treatment in a, in a cycle. And that's, again, a lot more like the way internet applications work today. Uh, all of this takes enormous amounts of data and the ability to extract meaning from data. That's the really secret science in the latest generation of, of Silicon Valley companies. Uh, there's a new term that's gaining currency called data science. And, and uh, this is actually a graph of uh, what you call data science skills on LinkedIn. They basically build these synthetic uh, uh, careers out of uh, uh, skill sets, and you can see how that graph is going uh, vertical. Next um, big idea I want to hit you with, and I know I'm going awfully fast here, is summed up in this wonderful quote from science fiction writer William Gibson. He said, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. And I have something heretical to say here, and that is the idea that innovation does not begin with entrepreneurs. It actually begins with people having fun. When you go back to the early days of something like the, uh, the Homebrew Computer Club, uh, there were a bunch of kids who were like, oh my God, I get to have my own computer. This is so cool. And in my career, I've watched that again and again, whether it was the early days of the PC, whether it was the early days of the World Wide Web, the early days of open source software, uh, now what we now call the maker movement. Uh, these are not people who are saying, I'm going to make my fortune. Let me go out and find a venture capital. Those guys didn't arrive for a few years later. We launched this thing called Maker Faire in 2005 with all these people building these crazy contraptions. And it was only the last couple of years that the VCs have shown up with their notebooks five or six years later. And of course, you know, here's another example. You know, these guys weren't trying to find and start an airliner. They were just going, how cool would it be to fly? So think about people having fun. And so when you think about healthcare, I, uh, this is a story I saw just the other day, a guy who kind of uh, uh, modified his prosthetic to have his, uh, his iPhone in it. You know, or here's some uh, U, um, University of Pennsylvania students who'd hacked to connect to build a haptic belt uh, for blind people. I don't know whether that's really going to work, but it shows this upsurge of, of hackers who are saying, wow, we can actually get involved in this stuff. And that, for me, has always been a key driver of my interest in technology, is when I see hackers arrive, people who are just in it because it's so cool. And that's why I'm here, because I see that happening now in healthcare. There are all these people arriving who are just saying, this is cool, this is fun, I want to do this. And some of them will turn into entrepreneurs. And of course, you know, you can kind of see, you know, we're getting a copy of this up device. Well, there have been hackers who've been playing with this quantified st self stuff for, for years, and now it's becoming consumer. And how cool is that? That's the progression. The entrepreneurs arrive, they see what hackers are doing, and they figure out how to simplify it. And that kind of uh, brings me to kind of a final idea here uh, from one of the great simplifiers of our time, uh, Apple. Uh, and it's a really important lesson, I think, for all of us who are building devices. Think about the evolution of the iPod. First of all, the original iPod as an advance over um, older music players, but then how it's evolved since then. One of the brilliant 
insights was that a lot of the interface was taken out of the device and put into this other program called iTunes. A guy from uh, uh, Microsoft once called the software above the level of a single device. Think about how you abstract your interface and take it into the cloud, uh, how you divide it among devices so that you can have a device like the UP, which has no UI on the device itself. The UI is all somewhere else. Really big idea from Silicon Valley that I think is going to have huge impact. But with all of that, I'm going to end, because he's on all of our minds lately, uh, with this wonderful quote from Steve Jobs, who can give us some guidance in how we think about taking deep ideas and then bringing them more and more into the mainstream. And it's about really understanding the meaning of design. Steve said, in most people's vocabulary, design means veneer. It's interior decorating. It's the fabric of the curtains and the sofa. But to me, design is the fundamental soul of a man-made creation that ends up expressing itself in successive outer layers of the product or service. So the heart of what we want to do is think about the essence. Think about the deep context of what people are trying to do. And then take that and build products from it. And that is, I think, what we can really learn from the titans of Silicon Valley. Thank you.